evening, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to another prime edition of Legends from the Past and Future. And uh, we have a nice one for you tonight. We're going to have Mr. Tony Spencer. Uh, uh, we are broadcasting live over Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And if you're on the YouTube channel tonight, please hit the subscribe button and subscribe to the show. And in the studio now is none other than Mr. Tony Spencer. How you doing, Tony? I'm doing, bro. Question for you. Is that too much light behind me? Actually, you're okay, man. Okay. Hey, go for it. Yeah, yeah, you're okay. Okay, but just understand you're in my office, you're in my paint studio, you're in my uh the family place <laughs> things are stored. So here we are. Okay, <laughs> I was hoping to be just on my phone, but here we are. Oh, it's, it's not a problem, not a problem at all. But it's 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 welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's good to have you on the show. You know, I, I've heard so much and uh uh, pretty excited and tonight is it's going to be you and I how's that that sounds great okay we're going to start first by taking you back oh big time tunnel now uh, uh actually people think Mr. C is the original time tunnel but the original time tunnel is right here with the legends from the past okay okay are you, are you ready I'm ready sir tell us uh where were you born and raised I was born in Glen Burnie uh, in Ann Arbor County, north of here, about, uh, I guess, 20 miles from where I am now, and uh, on Spencer Road. And uh, that road is very significant because my great-great-grandfather founded Freetown, as we know it, uh, but it started back on uh, Molly Creek area on Glen Burnie, coming from Glen Burnie High School, if you will. It was called Smith's Forest. He bought this land in 1845. December 26, 1845. So my family has been here six generations, but five and a half free. Wow, wow, wow. Well, tell us some of the things that you used to do or enjoy doing while growing up. While uh, growing up, actually, uh, singing was not initially the thing. It was like uh, you had dirt roads, bro. Okay, we were the farm community, longshoremen, uh, that kind of thing, okay? And uh, my wife, my mother was a housewife, and um, the most you may see in the community probably was uh, a U-shaped community. It really, if you look at it, it looked like a, a speedway, the way the roads went around in the community, okay? Wow. And it wasn't even graveled until the early 60s. Uh, and so I uh, was educated in First Marley Elementary on Sally Road by Hall United Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. And three schools combined into Freetown Elementary. Okay. And um, was there until 1960, oh, 1963? Yes. And now uh, went to Marlin Junior High School, was there until 1966, went to Northeast High School, and I graduated from there in 69. Oh, awesome. Northeast High School, huh? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, now, as a child growing up, were you involved in any athletic activities, or, or what are some of the things you used to do while growing up? In our community, we had what we call sandlot baseball or football, okay? okay. Uh, we had a field that was unofficially the community softball field. And if we played uh, <laughs> football, it was in the, the fall when the, the crops had been already taken and the, and the land was kind of flat, okay? But you played uh, just sandlot ball, man. You know, your, your cousins and friends and the yeah. people who were the older guys, they were the ones playing baseball. You watched them and then they started start teaching us how to catch a ball. I, my, my uncle bought me a, a first baseman's mitt and I grew into my teens where I was good in, in sports, baseball and football, very good in football, but I grew a love for singing. And it's having a musical background from elementary, uh -huh. uh, fourth through the sixth grade, I played five instruments. And then in the uh, ninth grade, uh, uh, I'm sorry, seventh through the ninth grade, it was uh, tenor sax and baritone sax. But then in the ninth grade, I got this bug, man. Uh, I could sing, but I didn't know what to do with it. My cousin yeah. introduced me to a doo-wop group. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then um, that uh, five months later, I recorded with them in March of 65, a place in Baltimore called uh, Bradley Studio on Howard Street. Uh -huh. and so That's while the song didn't go anywhere, it was just the experience. The experience of a ninth grader being in a studio Okay. As in the ninth grade, in the ninth, studio? In the studio, yeah. And then, uh, 
Mm. That was uh, 66, yes. Okay. And so okay. Um, the whole thing about it was being around guys who were five to 15 years older. Uh -huh. They were mentoring me and watching over me. My father said, yes, he can sing with you, but you better take care of him. And they did. So I was limited to what I could try to do. You know, you want to mock the uh, or mimic the, the, the big boys. Uh -huh. My mother put a big um, pin in that. She found tobacco in my coat pocket and said, I promise again, you will never sing. That's all she had to say. Because I love singing so much, I didn't want anything to get in the way. Okay? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you really, you really touched on my uh, uh, one of my questions, which was, would have been at what age did you and your parents realize you possess real talent and could pursue a professional career in music and art? Well, there's two different things now, okay? okay. The music was the first thing, but I come from a very musical family, the Halls and Pasadena, the Richards, uh, and they uh, hear names like Jennings, uh, Henson's, Cagers, as Pasadena and Serena Park, but we come from very musical families. And so my first cousin's singing, playing instruments, multiple instruments, okay? Mm -hmm. So I knew that I loved it, but I just knew that I didn't know really how good I was. I, I'm saying that not being arrogant, but mm -hmm. other people saw it and I couldn't see it. It's like you're playing a checker game and all you see is the next move, which is not the move you need mm -hmm. to win the game, but people standing behind you can see the overall picture. Now, I was self-motivated. And I say that because I didn't play instruments in school because my parents pushed me to. Yes. I played music in school because um, a music teacher named Mr. Thomas Whit Williams, this is still doing segregation. Mm. Okay? He put his hand on my shoulder in the third grade and he said, I want you to play trumpet for me next year. And like a little naive kid, I'm saying, wow, man, how does he know I can play a trumpet? Mm -hmm. Well, he kept moving me around. Fifth grade, I played a, a, a um, baritone. Sixth grade, I played tuba, French horn, and, uh, and um, see, tuba, French horn, French horn, it's, it's, it's a xylophone. And, anyway, a sousa, sousa phone, it's three inches. It's, I can't think of them right now. It's okay. It's okay. Tuba, sousa phone, French horn, yes. And so, so you, I'm going to let you continue on, but I got to ask you a question. Right. All right. What made you play baritone? And I, I say that because when I was in school, the music teacher said, well, you had the lips to play baritone. So I played baritone. So what was it? It was the teacher saying, I need help over here. But I thought he was doing that to be nice to me because I wasn't doing well. And that's why it's very important, man, for parents to encourage their children. I wasn't encouraged to play the trumpet to, to any instrument. He, he he put me where he wanted me to be. Yes. And that's where he had the need. I was a grown man. I hear this now. And those out there listening, I was a grown man before I realized from a cousin who played clarinet in, in the band, Clayton Green, Judge Clayton Green. He said, no, nah, man, you were doing great. That's, he moved you where he could use you and you could adapt. I needed to hear that. And that's why children need to hear from their parents the encouragement. I was self-motivated, but naive and not knowing why it was done. Mm -hmm, okay? mm -hmm. So when I got to middle school, I said, man, I'm away from that man. Well, in walks the music teacher from Marley Junior High. Is Tony Spencer here? Mr. Um, science teacher said, he's right there. He said, Mr. Williams said you would be a great saxophone player. I said, oh my God, what has he done? But I still didn't understand that, but I could catch on very quickly. Yeah. I had an above, above average IQ, but it being exercised, it's being encouraged, it's being practiced. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is so important, man. And so when I got in the ninth grade, when I recorded my first 45, the mistake I made was stop playing music because I could read it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to sing. Okay, fine. And then by the 10th grade, I was singing with another group and um, I was composing music, but I couldn't put it down on paper. I had to sing it to somebody. But in the 10th grade, <laughs> I played with another band called DC and the Capitals, and I bypassed Trey and the Diamonds, who I recorded with. But there was a Club Venus in Towson, and we were the house band, DC and the Capitals. And who was the main attraction? Smokey Robinson in America. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I met him, got that picture on a little Polaroid, took it around school, and then I lost the picture for like 40 years. And so uh, people said, man, you didn't see me no smoking. Well, three years ago, four years ago, I found the picture. 
And so it's on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. That experience, man. That experience <laughs> of someone who's doing it and saying, hey, Tony, put a hand on my shoulder. So Tony, man, uh, what you want to do, man? I said, man, I want to sing. He said, yeah, man, that's what you need to do. That's how he talked, right? <laughs> and then, uh, no, let, let me tell you, man, that touched my life forever. Wow. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's awesome. So you know what? Uh, Tony, really... How much involvement did Smokey have in you while you were singing? He had just just hearing his music. I had the ability to sing um, second tenor. Uh huh. Um, actually, back back then, I could sing first tenor, um, falsetto. Okay. Um, and so having the ability to sing different voices, I could sing songs like uh, some of his hits, you know, slow songs and all that. So. Um, and then I could sing, I try to sing James Brown, but not much. But The Temptations, Sam Cooke, Lou Rawls, Donna Washington, um, the groups like the uh, the Platters, the yeah. Carters. Then here comes The Temptations. Oh, Lord, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I was in heaven. Come on. Right? And so the same David Ruffin and then turn around and sing Eddie Kendricks. Yeah, yeah. That, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was all right. Man, I should say so. Now we're we're a little bit ahead of ourselves. Now, did okay. you go to did you go to college? I went to college, but not until I was in, I, I was age forty three. I okay. got my undergrad degree at Sojourner Douglas College in Baltimore. Okay, uh, they had um, the Annapolis campus. So even though we didn't have a physical campus in Annapolis, we would go from various places. But then by um, before the year was out, we went, we ended up in Baltimore. Graduated from Baltimore's campus. A few years later, I came back in um, 98 and um, started my master's degree. And so I said 98, a year's off. Anyways, 2000 and, and uh, I guess seven, I came back, 2009. Finished my master's by 2011. Wow. And so I was an older man, but it encouraged folks. My older sister said, well, if she did this, I can do it too. And she did. She got an undergrad degree and she's seven years older than me, you know? Wow, that's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Now, okay. Not only are you a recording artist, you're a composer, a poet, a model, right. Right. and a storyteller. Yes. All right. So we're gonna cover those areas, okay? okay. Cool. All right. So all right, now now we, we start off with your your an artist, a recording artist. Okay. okay. All right, let's let's talk about the uh uh groups that you came in contact with you it's a very uh esteemed uh list of names here like jimmy smith trio smith right. robinson the mirror war yeah. you know yeah. okay uh, uh uh so you actually sang with them i was opening act for them on the same stage with war wow. uh raheem devon um but you're the opening act okay you don't really have specific contact with some of these guys are so cool war they were so cool laid back man if you, were, if you were a product of the 70s, you understand when I said they were laid yeah. back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but uh, my ed the education with all of this is learning at 12 years old. You've heard of, have you heard of the Soul Stairs of Chicago, Illinois? The Soul mm -hmm. Stairs was a group that Sam Cooke left to start his R&B career. Okay. Okay. And after Sam Cooke left, Johnny Taylor also was there, but Johnny Taylor left. And when you heard of Johnny Taylor, it was only because that um, Otis Redding was killed. Yes. And that yeah. opened the gap for him to, okay, where it was. But uh, the Soulsters, after Sam Cooke had left, were groups coming locally, and our group at the time were called the Maltones. And we were the opening act for any gospel quartet that came through like that. So mm -hmm. the Soulsters from Chicago, Illinois, and um, the Harmonizing Four from Virginia. Okay. okay the first two. But then at the age 16, by that time, um, I, I wasn't singing for the band anymore, and my cousin, asked me to come and try for a gospel quartet. They didn't have a name yet. Uh -huh. but they were the same guys I was singing R&B with. Okay, so the relationship was there already. And um, I did. And then the guy who was our manager, and Kenny Anderson, who eventually became my brother-in-law, has sang for Reverend Julius Cheeks and Sensational Nightingales on the road for mm -hmm. two years. He came off the road. He was looking for a gospel quartet to manage, and we needed a manager. And so we were at uh, the Gospel Travelers anniversary and he talked to us afterwards and just like that, we had a manager. And so we, when groups like the Soul Stirs, the Mighty Clouds of Joy, uh, James Cleveland, Charlotte Season, um, all those 
all of those top gospel artists came to like I'll say the New Gillis Memorial in Baltimore. Okay. So we were one of the we were one of the groups, especially during the James Cleveland uh, gospel workshop. It was a national thing. Wow. So you you, you actually got a chance to sing uh, uh, on the same stage as James Cleveland. Yes. Shirley Caesar, uh, Mighty Clouds of Joy. Yes. Uh, so I mean, listen, man. Um, I forget the group's name right now, but they sang behind Paul Simon a song that Paul Simon sang, Love Me Like a Rock. <laughs> and they, they recorded that song and it became known now to the secular world. But the Ira Tucker was the lead singer for this group. And I can't think of the name of the group. I'm sorry. I should know it. But anyway, being exposed to all of that, and then um, I sang with the gospel serenade. This is what, that's what that group was named. Mm -hmm. from, I guess uh, from 68, broke for a minute because I went in the military and then I got stationed here in Annapolis. So we got back together and so we finally broke up in 74. Wow. Okay. Wow. Wow. Now, you know, uh, uh, Annapolis, uh, uh, look, <laughs> everybody that you came in contact with is amazing, but you know, Annapolis had a lot of, uh, uh in great entertainers. I know, you know, uh, uh, uh I, I gotta let you know, uh, uh, one person in particular, she, uh, she actually left a comment on my page in caps. I saw it. You know? That's my girl, man. <laughs> I performed with her and uh -huh. first times, and uh, she had put me on a map around around the different areas. And uh, the next opportunity we get, we're going to perform again together. Man, that's awesome. That's oh, awesome. Paris, Paris, Paris is awesome. Uh, yeah. Last opportunity, I think the best opportunity I had to sing with her was something called. Mozart, Motown, and more. Wow. Uh, Dr. Ernie Green from, uh, he was a chorale director and still is at Maryland Hall. Um, we needed another vocalist, duet vocalist, because the first one we had didn't work out. Mm -hmm. and Paris had one performance with us, and then um, the young lady named um, Sue Matthews, who's a jazz singer, but she was available. She loved the idea. She, so we partnered for a minute. Mm -hmm. We traveled around different places, uh, Calgary, Alberta. Okay, um, Italy, Fl uh, Florida, uh, with the Florida Orchestra, Indiana was Steph Scajari's hometown, mm -hmm. and quite a few times at Maryland Hall. And so Steph was my arranger. And so when we were, we were leaving his hometown on the plane, Steph and Sue started giving me ideas of what we needed to do. This is like February, the weekend that uh, Pittsburgh won the Super Bowl. And so that year, 2006, uh, recorded my next project and that was my first uh solo artist artist album as a as a individual and also singing r b a couple of albums before that i won a national talent search contest i don't know if you've heard of larnell harris or sandy patty but in gospel music they had won five grammys but in christian music they, they won five double awards and so mm -hmm. I, it was his national talent search contest mm -hmm. and so i won his national talent search contest so in gospel music um and uh, the, rec the, pro the um, prize for doing that was to record a solo album. And so Benson Records, which is owned by the Zonerman Book Publishing Company, uh, mm -hmm. I, I recorded, recorded to them. But once it was recorded, they gave me the master. <laughs> and now here the rest is up to you. So I had to be the executive producer as far as my wife, getting it out there. OK, and we did. Uh, it didn't do anything uh, beyond local, but it. It still was a major beginning, okay? But it came to a point by 2000, well, I guess when I started singing with uh, Ernie Green in late, I guess 98 and Steph, um, I wanted to do songs by those artists that I grew up learning and knowing. So so Sam Cooke, okay? And then it grew into where Ed Giroux was, okay? So it was a combination of uh, Marvin Gaye, okay? Uh, Stevie Wonder. And so those artists meant so much um, I said earlier, Donna Washington, what a difference a day makes, okay? Mm -hmm. The Sam Cooke song, people say, you have any gospel on there? I said, well, I have two religious songs on there. They said, what are they? I said, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, and Sam Cooke, A Change Is Going to Come. They said, they're not gospel. I said, no, but you, I'm answering your question. <laughs> Listen to those songs. They they touched on society, where it was at the time. Mm -hmm. It still speaks today, and both of them are dead. But the songs and the music still goes on because it has a strong message that it's it, it's it surpasses time. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, now, did you get a chance to manage any artists? Here's the thing. 
being a local person myself, even though I had been out there a bit, I I could have and I did try. But this is what happens when you are trying to manage local artists. Other people have outside influence because their children or grandchildren or cousins are in the group and they give influence. And that's fine, but they should have come to me first. And people don't understand that uh, thing of respect. Okay, yeah. so we've asked him to uh, manage us, but we, you're my cousin and I trust you, but mm -hmm. they didn't understand the mindset. You, it's really hard to manage local folks unless they have been raised in a mindset of mm -hmm. this person who's teaching you, okay? Gotcha. So yeah. I got to a point of understanding that, and just let me say this to you, and anyone who's in the, the what you're doing, professional singing, playing, whatever, people like it as long as you're not doing good. Ah, uh, yeah. But yeah. as soon as you start doing good, oh, he thinks he's all that. No, you think that and you don't like it. Yeah. Okay? yeah. Don't blame me for how you're thinking. I've been born with a lot of gifts and I had a dream that scared me to death, that mm -hmm. I had not fulfilled all of the gifts that God had given me. Wow. And so, man, oh, bro, it was a nightmare. Wow. That God had hold of me and wouldn't let me go. And mm. that's, that's how my painting became alive. And so mm. I started painting in high school, but I stopped after high school in 69 and didn't start again until 2006. My wife had a situation with an uh, organization here in the city. Mm -hmm. And anyone that knows me, I want to go after them. But she said, no, let me handle it. So she bought me a Jacob Lawrence painting kit. And I started painting that, that night. When she came back, the painting was finished. And so uh, that painting will never be sold. It's on that dining room wall. So still, again, didn't continue. 2008, I painted another one. 2009, 2010, and then it sat again. Mm. Well, I was uh, laid off from the city because of my mouth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I said some things I had to say, but I shouldn't have said. Mm -hmm. And so I got laid off. With that time period between that time, uh, the end of June, and the latter part of 2014, of December, oh, it was a very dark time, bro. Mm. Very dark. But let me say this to you. I have had 31 art exhibits. One is in South Korea. I had two opportunities in South Korea, but when COVID came, it gave me my money back and didn't get that opportunity again. But another one came in 2021, and it was uh, really fulfilled in 2022. And so... My paintings have been around the world. My singing have been, has been around the world. My CDs have been around the world. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you, if you don't understand it, you're being prepared for something you've asked for. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. The last thing a person could do if they really don't understand it is say, God, give me patience. Oh, really? <laughs> you're going to go through so much until you understand, but this is what I had to go through to understand. Okay, so the road to success ain't paved with you no know, gold bro it's it's paved with heartache and pain 999 yeah. failures and then you hit one major success and all the people who from that point know it's the success yes yes, yes. so if you've grown and really appreciated what was going on you understand i couldn't have gotten here without those 999 failures oh that's awesome that's powerful that's powerful that's powerful so now now now, now you're taking me into uh Tony, the storyteller. Okay. The storyteller came, personal experiences, and that came really from being a uh, in the military. Mm -hmm. I got up and I was a firefighter and being a paramedic. Oh God. So yeah, you tell you take the stories, you change the names, okay, and you write portrait from that. And then I realized the portrait really were stories of my experiences. Mm -hmm. And I had someone to um Go through my book. I'm trying to think of edit my book. And this one guy said, You got some good work here, but most of what you have here are lyrics. And I already knew that, but I still had to put it down in the book as poetry because mm -hmm. at that point, nothing was done with them. And I had everything that was a song in that book, I had music for. It's yes. all okay. So the stories come from experiences I've had some very dark, I mean, some very dark experiences by being a paramedic. And uh, that was the only thing that kept me sane. Okay. So if I recited something to you, it, it would sound so good, but you didn't understand how this thing happened. And it wasn't always about me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
this, let me say something real quick. It's one, one verse. See the little boy playing in the sand. Who ever thought one day he'd be a man? Fighting his battles, but leading man. Someone should have told him it was, it was part of the plan. Someone should have told him it was part of the plan. So that one verse talks from this little boy going into manhood. That one verse. Mm-hmm. That one verse. And so the next one is but a little girl. And so I gave that to a couple uh, for their wedding, and it was so nice. And people saw it. But my God, man, they didn't understand how I, how I got there. Mm. Everybody don't want to hear a story the way it is. You have to find a way sometimes to make it fit into yeah. society. Um, and people say, like, gracious, uh, I know you haven't got to the art yet, but I, I'm an abstract artist, and I feel like singing sometimes is the same way because it scrambles, so many things scramble in your head to put together a final product. So I doubt if most people want to be in, a, in the head of a person who sings and paints, all right? Mm. Because it's not always pretty. Mm. It's not always pretty. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're gonna save your art for last because I have some some pictures, some some of your drawings that I'm gonna post, and you can explain or you can tell us okay. what were you feeling at the time of your drawings? Because you, you know you have to be feeling something, right? Uh, mm. So so let's let's talk a little bit briefly, just briefly about uh the AJ Spencer and Consultants LLC. Mm-hmm. What is that all about? That kind of started back in, I guess, before I, um, I was in 1982. And the Cassandra part was my experience with doing things in the community and mm-hmm. knowing I had something to offer. But then comes along me recording my, this, uh, because I won this national talent search contest. And when I would call companies, um, Okay, yeah, no, we don't, we're not interested. So I said, let me call, let me, I, I became a, a record label. Call the same people back. Oh, sir, please hold on. Okay, so out of the, some of those things, but out of need, okay, the LLC came in, for instance, when um, I don't know how many people knew, they knew about the baseball stadium in Washington, right? Mm-hmm. So three, three, two other friends and I had an office in Washington because we wanted to, my background was in, being a fire marshal inspector and i was nationally certified so that's where that part came in okay okay that was back in 05 but how many people knew at that time that a soccer stadium was coming as well and if anyone knew dc and knew how southeast dc was and all this all this property that was if do you know D, south southeast dc yes okay yeah, yes if you knew it back in the day and see how it looks today it was done all because of that stadium that was coming in not because the baseball stadium was there, the soccer stadium was also coming in. Okay, and I didn't know that. Okay, okay, but look at, here's a mindset. Mm-hmm. Look at who was coming to this country mm. and what sports were in their countries, these poor countries. Mm-hmm. Okay, so people who couldn't afford to live in affordable housing. Yeah. yeah. It's what they did was to build a stadium with the kind of games they came from those different nations. Mm. And listen, man, those nations had diff- all different kind of colors, you know? Racist. Yeah. yeah. And so while you see it going up, for one thing, there's a mindset behind, okay, they're poor now, but if we get them in here and get a stadium here, we can help lift other people up. Now, that is not a capitalist mindset, but that's a business mindset, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, it kind of sounds like it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. But having people around you say, listen, yeah, okay, we could do a stadium. Who, who is your audience? Well, let's build infrastructure so that we can have people in here like that who can move from where they are in the lowest part of the town uh other counties around dc mm-hmm. so but not many people like you and i knew that that soccer stadium was going to be built yeah but yeah. our office was too late <laughs> yeah yeah, you know? yeah 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 man this 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 is really awesome now now I, I'm, I'm looking at uh uh your theater performances, all right? Let's talk a little bit about your theater performances. Okay. I did my first theater performance with uh, Colonial Players. It's um, on East Street in Annapolis off of State Circle. Mm-hmm. If you would take East Street, make a right, the first, second building is a uh, small garage, and then there's Colonial Players. And I was introduced to that only because a guy came into the farm watcher's office, asked my battalion chief, did he know anyone who was singing? Because we have a musical coming up. My battalion chief said, well, Tony sings. 
And I wasn't even really listening because he was talking about battalion chiefs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he said, listen, Tony, uh, we have some trials for a musical in January. Uh, how about you come past and try it out? So listen, I wasn't serious. I said, yeah, OK. And so the weekend before the tryouts, here he comes in the office. <laughs> I said, oh, God. <laughs> so I said that Friday, yes, I will be there on Sunday. Meanwhile, my brother lived in South Hill, Virginia, and got very sick. Mm. And I had to take my mother and two sisters to South Hill, right? So I said, well, now I have a reason not to go to the uh, tryout. We were back by Saturday, so I still had to go. Kept mm -hmm. my so I got there, and I never read any, any lines before. I read, OK, that was good. OK, I had to sing. So I sang a song uh, from my um, gospel recording. OK, got past that. He said, but there's some dancing in the musicals. We're going to take you upstairs and see how well you can dance. Now, I had rhythm. I said, oh, well, I know I'm not going to pass this one there, boy. <laughs> so within two nights, I'm working. <laughs> it was a play called Working by Studs Turkle. He was a very famous uh, radio announcer in Chicago. Uh -huh. He went around asking people, if you could be what you really wanted to be, what would it be? And he had these sequences of people doing things. I was loving out the parking lot attendant. OK, and so I had a dance with that. And then um, a guy named um, Schwartz, I can't think of his first name, uh, adapted into a musical. That's, and that's how I got to do that. And so that was the opening of a very great opportunity. And then a lady named Shari Villario had written a play called The Annapolis, I remember, from 1900 to 1960. Mm -hmm. And she, she, then she took the same material and showed how people of all races and cultures celebrated mm -hmm. and so she had seen me in the first plane working the colonial players and she asked what i consider because this was a musical musical too okay and um i did and then a guy named ted cooper who was married to valerie mills and ted was dr ted cooper from um he worked um at uh, howard university he had had a theater group long before i met my wife and um so he asked me to play the part of a uh, play that he wrote for about Mr. Walter Mills. And while we hear about mm -hmm. Mr. Walter Mills is the gentleman who sued Anna County in 1937. <laughs> Mr. Martha was his attorney. So I, play, I played the part of, of Mr. Mills. So I had mm -hmm. to learn about who he was. And so when we start talking about uh, Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, Mr. Mills and other places around the country, because them, them uh, suing the, the different jurisdictions and different school systems, um, he helped make that happen as far mm -hmm. as it was done. Okay, in 1939, Thurgood Marshall was his attorney and they won. He was suing because he wanted all black teachers and administrators to get equal pay as whites. And it took this okay. case to court and they won the case. Awesome, awesome. So he had that experience in, in knowing about Mr. Mills and went to church with him at St. Philip's Episcopal Church on Bestgate Road. Uh, I kind of knew him, and so I'm playing his part. But my God, what a role, man. What a role. I can imagine. Yeah. Now, 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 since we're, we're speaking, since we're speaking history right now, uh, let's talk about Freetown. Okay. And the uh, Civil War and Acme. Okay. Uh, tell us about that. Well, my, I, Freetown came about because my great great grandfather, um, bought land, his first 56 acre strip of land from a place that we call today Molly Creek. It was called Smith's Forest. So mm -hmm. Smith's Forest went from Molly Creek on into what we know today as Freetown. Okay. And so he bought that land from the Young and Smith families. And he bought that land for $1,500, bruh, in, in 1845. Wow. That's a lot of money. Yeah. That's a lot of money. But he was a farmer and mm. listen, he worked, he worked and worked. And some of the land he bought by himself. Mm -hmm. but that's he bought he bought the land for the for Freetown. So when people think of Freetown today, if you think of a light bulb and lead on the side, the small end that you screw in, that was Molly Creek. And the big bulb that people see now, that's what people see today is Freetown. But it's between Spencer and Howard Road, Freetown started back maybe um a quarter of a mile off of Molinick Road. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, uh, people who were free built there, and then people who were, were manumitted and won their freedom 
some of them moved there. Mm -hmm. It has a very strong history of how black communities, black enclaves came together and stayed together because they stuck together. Yes. You yes. Know? And so he bought other lands in, in Freetown in uh, 1817, he and five other men, and they were Masons, mm -hmm. a large number one. <laughs> and so he bought uh, the land so the Negro men and boys could be educated. Okay. And the first place of education in Freetown was their lodge, the Good Templar Lodge Number One. Mm. And so he and his his uh, different friends at different times would buy land. Um, and but this is the most education was most most significant. But here's the thing with the faith community: there was a place in uh, water. We call it Waterbury. The white folks may call it Sunset Beach. Uh -huh. But if I said Elk Ridge, where would you think of Elk Ridge being? Elk Ridge. Elk Ridge up by the airport in Howard County, blah, blah, blah. Yes. yes. This Elk Ridge was all the way down in what we know today as being Sunset Beach and Waterbury. Really? That's how far down it came. If uh -huh. you tell people about the history of this county and the Glen Burnie, Glen Burnie went all the way to Pennsylvania line before Baltimore County was in place, 1600s. Okay? Wow. And so when you go looking for information here, you find things that you weren't looking for, but my God. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah. So Freetown was very important. The first place of having education for these students uh, mm -hmm. was very important. Sunday school teacher, someone in the family who read very well. Okay. You have some people who are more educated, but they didn't have college, but they had enough that they could teach these kids up to a point. Man, man, that's that's now. Now you've written some books, right? I've written stories back in um, 2003. My uncle knew I. I uh, wrote poetry and I had, I think, an, oh uh, boy, was it 82? Anyway, some stuff in uh, Who's Who and some kind of another publication for English. Mm -hmm. I did eight, eight poems. Okay. So my uncle knew I did that. He said, like, you write poetry. Why don't you write about James Spencer? I said, man, I don't anything about James Spencer. He get his hit. Here's the land he bought. Okay. <laughs> here's his will. <laughs> had no excuse. Mm -hmm. And so that's how that started. So in the uh, Anne Arundel County Historical Society, um, they asked me to write an article uh, about my great great grandfather. So I first wrote it about his will, and seeing that what he put in his will, man, he was very 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 well off for anybody, not just being black. But yeah. Anybody. And so I wrote in 2004 about his will. Then in 2004, a friend named Chris Haley, he works for the archives, state archives on Round Boulevard. Uh, I was asked to write about uh, his land deeds. Mm -hmm. So I happened to have a, a number of um, researchers who helped me research the land deeds that uh, I'll say some of them um, about James Spencer. So that happened then with that. And then after that, I realized, yes, I had started writing poetry. I had certain people started writing uh, things about a book, but it just were transcripts. They were just transcripts. Now I got my transcript copy written back in 2008 i let everything else get in front of it okay wow. and i've done a lot of things in between so i promised my wife because she was my second editor my final editor and i said listen january 1 i'm not gonna do any more art exhibits i'm working on my transcript and yeah. i started and then i my cousin asked me to do a three-hour art exhibit and i did it but i'm, <laughs> I'm finished <laughs> okay, i gotta get this book done this year i have a publisher and um, it's a lot that I have done, but God required a lot of me. Mm, mm, mm. Greg, what's your talent? What are you doing with it? Yes, yes, yes. I have to get this book yeah. done. Yeah. Well, you know, God has a way of motivating us. You know, he has a way of shaking us up. That's right. No. It comes from sometimes the most unusual places. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. But you know, I, I have to mention her name. I'm not. I don't know if you know her, uh, Michael Matthews. Yeah. Uh, she told me. She said, you know, when you talk to him, ask him about the Civil War in Ackman and okay. Freetown. Okay. You know, uh, and and I was able to hit you up while you were driving. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's that's a couple of things about Freetown uh, about the Civil War. Yeah. My great great grandfather fought in the Civil War. And blacks didn't go into the Civil War until 1862. Uh -huh. um, but he was in the 39th Infantry. And if you read about the 39th, you also read about the 24th and a couple of others. And then you stay in Maryland. They went through the South. And the things they did, 
and he was part of this, but I think he was a cook. Okay. I think he was a cook. Okay. Okay. Because some other friends found some other James Spencer's. So I said, let's let's compare the signatures. Uh-huh. And his signature was the closest to this one where this guy was a cook. Okay, fine. The troops had to eat. Okay. But he was there. And he got injured. Yeah. He got injured. Yeah. So, um, when he got out of the war, there was a, a infantry infirmary n- near um the black uh this oh boy, Druid Hill Park. It was near Drew Druid Hill Park. And so he and two other friends, one was named Snowden, and the other one was Dotson. D- By that time, it was D-O-T-S-O-N, but Dotson's original name was D-O-D-S-O-N. And Dotson's son married Jane Spencer's granddaughter. And that's how the Dotsons and the Spencers became related. Okay? okay. Yeah. So, and um, that's all I really can talk about as far as what I know, uh, like you said, about Acme. And that I haven't dealt with. I'll be very honest with you. I, I can't shoot no bull and tell you. I, no, I don't. Okay. I had a limited with my grand, great great grandfather. I started finding out things. Then I started finding out, man, he had nine sons and three daughters. Okay. Black folk around here related to everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's on my, my father's side. Yeah. On my mother's side, my grandfather's mother was a Kess, K E S S. Okay. She was one of 14 children, right? Nelvana, yes. Yeah. She had 19 children. Okay. So look, man. Good God. My grandfather's mother was a Gaither. Okay, my father. So, listen, we wow. listen to everybody, man. Yes, that's back true. In the, back in the day, I, I'm I got off I got off uh, off uh, course. So. I did. I, I could tell you all I could, all, all I could really say about my great great grandfather about the Civil Wars that he served in, but we believe that he was a cook, but he was injured still during that time, um. So he served I guess the late next three years, okay. Did you know that blacks didn't get paid until they ended in the, into the end of their enlistment, and so uh, they saved up. Yes. Wow. A fear that they would run. Isn't that something? Man. And we fought in every war from the Revolutionary War, war on, and they they feared because they knew how we were treated. Yes, yes, yes. Could you imagine how that would be if they tried that today? Oh, God. Wow. Yeah. Well, Tony, I'm going to show you something, and let me know if this is one of your signature paintings. Okay. That was the last exhibit I did uh, in, in 2023. Uh it was a 24 piece exhibit. This one is called the library. And okay. if I, I should have mentioned earlier, I'm an abstract painter. Okay. I can take abstract and make it look real. I can take real look, make it look abstract. But my goal, my mindset, my heart is abstract. So this is called the library. And um, I intentionally made it look like books were standing in different <laughs> places, different, you know, some laying down, some standing up, but yeah. other folks have seen different things in this. And, and this is what I understand. Whatever my buyer sees is their reality by the painting. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. So what about, what about this painting right here? Okay. This was my uh, 2000 and I painted, this is part of um, 30 by 48 painting. And I broke them down and I broke them down because of this. Uh, Dr. Joan Gaither from the, uh, from MICA, the Merlin Institute of Commercial Art. Mm-hmm. She said, listen, I teach my students, she came to see my, this one painting, and I teach them to find, she said, let's take a Renoir, to find paintings within the painting. And that night she found 15 paintings, and since that time I found 30. So this wow. was used on the 2016 Kunta, Kunta Kinte Heritage Festival. That was the, the one for that year. And you see the E in there, that's my watermark, because it... Uh, it came from my website. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this one is a warrior. This whole painting was really about me. I was going through this dark time. Uh-huh. And this painting says, he's telling Papa Julo, you see the top of the head, with, okay, of this guy across from him. Yes. Yeah. Papa Julo, who is the chief of the tribe. And he's okay. going to Papa Julo because he's saying, I lost my power. So okay. Papa Julo says, you can never lose your power. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's what that's about. If you also notice that uh, on this painting, 
if you can see people's feet, he doesn't have any feet. He didn't doesn't have any hands. Uh -huh. He has symbols of power. You can give away your power, but I don't care how bad you get beaten down, but people cannot take it from you. Man, that's, okay? that's awesome. Yeah. Also notice that they are not in the water. They're on the water. Mm, yeah. <laughs> okay? okay. Yeah. Wow. Wow. This is from the same painting from a different direction. This is called Trob Queen. And so abstractly um, posed. Mm -hmm. And some of these things, I'll be honest with you, people had to show them to me. And I painted them. But when they saw something, and subconsciously, sometimes you are doing things that you say you're not have no intention of doing. Mm -hmm. But subconsciously, man, people need to listen to the subconscious because that's that's where the deepness of you really is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So this is tribe queen. Man, man. Okay. And this is um chalk and magic marker. And I haven't re I haven't released these yet. Uh it's about <clears throat> I'll say 15, but they're no more than 10 by 10. Um, so I, I took different angles of his face, sometimes just the one eye. Mm -hmm. I, this initially was just black and white. Okay? okay. And the black and white one really to me is more, and people say it's more powerful because it makes them look at what it is for them to look at this. Okay. I colored this so you can see the face. If I hadn't colored it, and they look very closely, they would have seen three faces coming together at different places. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And so there's other things on there. One painting, I'm not sure if you can bring it up, but it's actually upside down and it looks like a woman from the 40s primping. Okay. Maybe I didn't send that one. Yeah, I don't. Okay. This, the, no, I think this is the uh, only other one that I have. Okay. This right here uh, is saying, Father, I need you. Mm. This is called Warrior's Offering. And notice that he's, uh, the way he's standing, he's, the flames are going from his hand like he's worshiping and praying. Yeah. Over to the other corner are maybe 25 breasts of different sizes, different shapes. And besides that, you see this little blue piece right here, got a, uh, all from that, uh, sort of this dark blue, uh, it's, it's actually the serpent, the snake. And so okay. where he was earlier, Touching hands with Papa Julu around mm -hmm. Papa Julu's ankles, around his waist, and around his neck is a serpent. And the serpent is pointing towards those breasts. People get so afraid. They say, I like the painting, but I don't like the serpent. If you don't know the meaning of the serpent, yes, you would say that. But if I point them to the American Medical Association symbol. What do you see? You see a staff. And the staff represents um, this, the uh, nervous system and the spinal column. And then you go up and you see um, two wings, okay? And the wings, left and right spheres of the brain. Mm -hmm. Serpent is spiritual healing and wisdom. If you don't understand that, you'll miss a meaning of something that's done. Oh, that's, 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 that's deep. That's, <laughs> that's, that's deep. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And if you could back that up again. Over top of his the back, you see something that's a breast right there. Okay. Okay. It was two. The guy didn't make it wide enough for this one. Um, you see birds flying around them. Mm -hmm. I took everything I could in this painting to use it in like one is called Pose Raven. It's called mm -hmm. Pose Raven because look at a part of the painting, it was the head of Poe with a goatee, and these birds flying around, flying around him. So I called that one Pose Raven. And it's really actually about Two inches above this, uh, where his guy's feathers are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now, do you actually have a shop where you sell these uh, drawings? I have my house. Look, I, <laughs> I got you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I'm getting ready to fix up my uh, website. This one too. I can sell them online. Okay. Okay. But my goal, my goal of my paintings, is to make products out of them. Okay. And that's all I'm going to say about that. I got you. No problem. Well, I tell you, Tony, this this has really been awesome. And uh, I, I really thank you for uh, uh, taking the time to spend with me tonight. You know, uh, 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 it's been real. You know, I had some challenges early on, but uh, 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 this 
has really been worth it. And I, and I, I thank you. And you are truly worthy of the label legend. Wow, oh, man. Yeah. Listen, I'll be honest with you. When I first saw it, I said, somebody's playing with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because the person who's in this, man, they just do what they do. Yeah. You know, you, too, you can't be worried about what uh, people are saying about it. If you have a gift, please exercise that gift. You don't want to, you don't want to lose it. And losing with me, you're paying, I'm not going to do anything with it. And then you lose your hands. Yeah. Well, okay. you, you know, my, my final question to you is, uh, 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 what encouraging word would you leave to the viewers out there? Uh, we have a lot of kids who watch the show, right? as well as adults, but a lot of kids. What encouraging word would you leave them or leave with them uh, to become successful just as you are? Read, read, read. Allow yourself to be educated. And not because the person looks like you, okay? So this is what I'm gonna leave with you. Accept the gift because of who the gift giver is. Because the gift giver may not look like you. Mm -hmm. Accept mm -hmm. the gift. That's awesome, that's yeah. awesome. Well, there you have it, folks. Uh, 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 Mr. Tony Spencer, uh, uh, it's been great having you on the show tonight. And uh, 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 tune in again next week uh same time uh it may be a different day uh we're gonna have a, a, a redo with uh jeff brown the uh a quiet storm dj at whur at one time but uh, uh thanks for joining us tonight and we will see you again next week with the complete staff peace